August, Europe and other regions in the world experienced the hottest and highest temperature ever recorded. The unusually warm temperature continued in autumn. The average temperature in September 2023 has reached three degrees higher than the long-term trends measured between 1981 to 2010. 15 years ago, I lived in England, and I remember how much I used to enjoy the Indian summer. It's a term that the British people used to refer to the unseasonably warm, dry weather in autumn, like the one that we experienced this year. Um, but actually, when we think about extreme temperatures in summer, it's actually very lethal. Last year, it is estimated that as many as 61,000 people died in Europe due to summer heat wave. Amongst them, 18,000 life loss in Italy alone. I find this number extremely worrying because we know from the climate models that the global average temperature will keep on rising. It's going to be higher. And as a consequence, extreme um, climatic events will become more frequent, more intense, and more severe. I moved to Italy in January 2022, and I can say that we don't have to look far to find an example of climate change impact. First, we experienced two years of consecutive droughts in northern Italy, followed by the worst flooding in 100 years in Emilia-Romagna, this is where I live, forest fire in Sardinia, and the unusually warm temperature in October that we just recently experienced. So we can say that these climate, extreme climate events have already affected our health and well-being, like in the case of mortality that I just mentioned. Droughts can also destroy crops. Flood can lead to um, infrastructure, production, and services disruption, and it can affect our um, income and job loss. So climate change can affect our life directly, like in the case of mortality, or it, it can affect our life indirectly, like in the case of income loss. And this makes me wonder whether climate change also affects population dynamics, and if so, how? One of the important job of demographer is to project the future population, population size and demographic structure. Last year, the world has reached 8 billion people, and we are on the trajectory of becoming between 9 to 11 billion people by the end of the century. Of course, I cannot tell you the precise number of the future population because it depends on the models that we use, it depends also on the uncertainties, and it also depends on the assumptions that we make about the future population. But if increase in temperature will lead to an increase in mortality, then it is about time that we have to build in also the future impact of climate change on the way we think about future mortality. And this point is not trivial. Up until now, what we know is that cold weather is a bigger killer than heat. But if this relationship will change, then we would have to change also how do we think about future population. Up until now, none of the existing global population projection ever built in the potential impact of climate change when we think about uh, how population will evolve. And I think it is about time that we do so. So for us, for demographers to understand how future population would look like, we need to know about three demographic components. The first one is fertility. So how many people were born? The second one is mortality. How many people died? And also about migration. So how many people moved in and how many people moved out in a given location in a given time period? I've already mentioned about the impact of climate change on mortality. What about fertility? 
I cannot see you very well, but um, I think that there are many young people in the audience, and I wonder whether you ever thought about not having children because of climate change, or maybe some of your friends may have mentioning so. So I am very curious. So I did a survey last year of 3,500 people aged 18 to 34 years old in five European countries, including Italy. And I asked them about their fertility intention. So what we found is that 55% of the people that we asked reported that they're not planning to have a child in the near future because they're very concerned about the potential negative impact that climate change may have on their future child. About 39% of people also said that they are very worried about the potential carbon footprint impact that putting an extra person in the, in the planet can have. A desire to have children is called fertility intentions. Fertility intentions are strong predictor of fertility behavior. The idea of not having children because of climate change is very recent. It started around 2018 uh, together with the Friday for Future movement. So actually for us, for demographers, it's too soon to, to see whether the younger people who say that they do not want to have children because of climate change would go on and not having children when they, when they finish their reproductive career. So I need to observe them again when they turn the age of 45 and above, then we can observe whether they actually translate their fertility intention into fertility behavior or not. In any case, because concern about climate change may translate into fertility behavior, then it is important that we also build this in, into our demographic assumption. Now, seeing this image, you may wonder how people who live in the areas heavily affected by climate change sustain their livelihood. Imagine if they keep on experiencing droughts for many years and they cannot grow crops anymore. What would they do? Do they need to move to look for a job somewhere else? And if they decide to move, would the entire household move or just one person? It can be the household may say, okay, I'm gonna send the, the young one, the highly educated one, because they are able to find a job in a city and can uh, remit the income back into the household. We found in our research that experiencing negative climatic conditions can lead to out-migration but only for some subgroups of population. It is not going to be the richest one that move because they can adapt, and not the poorest one either because they don't have the capacity to migrate. In fact, sometimes we find that migration movement can decline when farmers experience drought because they, they, because they cannot generate the agriculture income to finance their migration. So we, don't, we actually don't have the strong evidence to support the idea that climate change may induce mass migration across the continent. And this is precisely because the vulnerable population may not be able to use migration as an adaptation strategy. So the most common pattern that we find about climate-induced migration is actually a very short distance within the same country and tend to be those people who rely on agriculture for their livelihood. So what do we know by far from the research? So we have some evidence that climate change affects fertility, mortality, and migration. But more importantly, what our research has shown is that the impact of climate change is not going to be distributed evenly across population subgroups and across geographical locations. The president of the European Commission, von der Leyen, has recently said, climate change is caused by humans. We can solve it. I personally find this message conveys a hint of optimism because climate change is caused by human activities. So it's not by the supernatural forces. So we can do something to solve it. 
but to tackle climate change, we need a serious commitment from all sectors in the society, both the national level and international level. So what I want to share with you is the two key findings from my research that I think it is relevant when we think about solutions. The first one, because we know that climate change has affected our life, and also the demographic outcomes. So if you want to understand how population would evolve in the future, because this is extremely important for policy planning, so we need more empirical research and data. And I like to emphasize that the data that we collect should be disaggregated by population characteristics and geographical locations. Let me use the recent floods in Tuscany, I think all of you have seen from the news, um, as an example. The president of the Tuscan region announced that they would suspend mortgage payment for private household. And I think this message obviously is very welcoming, but we need to know more about the characteristics of these households. Migrant and poor households are likely to be renters. They're not owning home. So in a sense, they're not going to benefit from this scheme. Migrants and poorer households also take longer time to recover from hazard events. So this is just an example to show that when we collect the data, it needs to be as detailed as possible because we would need this kind of information to tailor the policy that target the needs of the most vulnerable population. The second finding that emerged from my research is that education can be a very important factor that help reduce vulnerability. And by education here, I refer to formal schooling. And I want to share with you the research that we've done in India. So we look at the impact of floods on child malnutrition. And we found that even though the family is poor, but if the mother has at least a secondary level of education, then she can protect her child against being stunted. Stunting refer to the state when a child is too short for their age and is an indicator of chronic malnutrition. And the reason why education can protect the children because the mother being educated, it, she has better risk perception, has better access to information and also can improve the problem solving skills. So the capacity of highly educated mother to protect the children against the health risk. Um, highly educated mother coming from poor family, this capacity, we find that it is exactly the same as a mother who come from rich family, but have low level of education. So put it simple, so I just want to say that we find that education substitute money to help people to cope with extreme climatic events. Education is an investment in human capital. With the COVID-19 pandemic and also the ongoing war and conflict, disrupting schooling of many children in different parts of the world. So I want to emphasize that we need to make sure that these children, they have the quality education that they deserve. Because we know from the research, it's very clear that education as a human capital, it would equip the people with the capacity to respond to and adapt to climate change. The impact of climate change is already being felt today in all regions in the world. So it is important that we need to do something urgently to minimize this impact. And we need to ensure that climate change mitigation and adaptation actions are inclusive and no one is left behind. Grazie. <laughs>